Hello, welcome to chapter one. Um, we're going to be looking at this and during this lecture that we're going to be looking at chapter one, the science of human development. Um, basically what this is going to be covering is just kind of a, a <clears throat> what is it that we're actually looking at? What is the, the tools that are used by psychologists uh, in studying human development? As well as a little bit of the history uh, and background that let, led us to where we are today. Um, so some of the key figures that, that have developed this, this, uh, this field of psychology. Um, <clears throat> so human development, what we're going to be looking at basically in this is going to be throughout the semester, it's going to be from conception, the moment where the, the, the individual sperm and egg come together and you have the little first one cell zygote that shows up, um, all the way up until death of old age. Um, so, and, and then actually even going beyond that, we're going to be looking at some cultural aspects of death um, and, and kind of how we deal with it and things like that in the final piece of this, uh, of this class. So <clears throat> hopefully you're all going to be enjoying this. this is, I find this to be one of the more fascinating subjects. Um, it really gives you a lot of insight into ourselves as humans, uh, as well as into any people that you're going to be dealing with. Really, it's going to be a very useful class for anyone who's going to be working with any people in any way, shape or form. Um, so on that note, quick note also, there's, there's two, uh, there's two quizzes within each chapter. Okay. One quiz is going to be a, a chapter test, which is basically just going through and it's going to be looking at the vocabulary and things from the chapter. So if you read the book, um, that's basically what that test is for is just making sure you've read the book. Okay. At least, at least look through it and have a little like skim through it and get some of the basic ideas out of it. Um, the other one is going to be a, a, uh, test that's directly connected to these lectures. And these lecture quizzes are going to be random information. Some of it might be relevant to what it is we're looking at. Um, some of it's going to be just flat out random facts uh, <coughs> that I just throw in there. There's four questions. I'm going to kind of scatter them throughout the lecture. I'll make it really obvious uh, that it's when I'm talking about it. So it's not like, wait, what is it? What was he talking about? Okay. I will be like, all right, you know, random fact number one or something like that. But, um, just that way, you, you write that down, write down the, the information from it, and then you can, you can, it'll make those tests really easily, okay, or really easy to do. Multiple choice, no timer, all that stuff. Um, so make sure you're doing that. Uh, those, that quiz will come open as soon as you've opened this video. So basically, at this point, you can take that quiz if you wanted to, although I would recommend watching the video first to make sure that you get um, that, that information right for it. Okay. Um, as far as I, I think that's all I wanted to talk about before we actually rolled into the lecture. Um, so again, we're going to be looking at chapter one. Oh, PowerPoints. Power, you can find the PowerPoints in, in D2L, the same area where you found this video in the content um, in D2L. You can find the PowerPoints. There are three ways that you can follow along if you'd like with this video. One is to open it up in a, in a separate, uh, like on your browser, you can open up another tab. Um, and, and open up D2L in there and then open it up in there and kind of follow along while you're listening to the video playing on this. Um, <clears throat> the other is to uh, download it so that you can basically access the PowerPoint then from your computer. And the third is to print it off. If you like a hard copy to take notes on and things like that, that might be a good way to do it. If you don't really care about that, no big deal. The PowerPoint is basically just gonna be my lecture notes. Um, so you can choose to use them or not. Like it, 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 there's nothing specific on the PowerPoint that you're going to need directly from the PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, give you the heads up there. Another option for this video, you can watch it here on D2L. You can also choose, these are actually uploaded onto YouTube, so you can actually choose to watch them through YouTube if you like. So if you want to watch it on your phone, uh, or if you have like a TV with a Roku or a smart TV or something hooked up to it, like a Fire Stick or whatever, um, you could technically watch this on your TV if you'd prefer. So you can, you can open it up through YouTube, it'll enter into your uh, play history, and then you can access that through those different options. So there's some different ways that you can you can access these videos um, also. I know for myself, I prefer to usually watch them either on a TV, if I want to be watching something on a TV or on my phone, um, that way I could be wandering around doing other things while I'm listening. So, um, but yeah, those are some different things. Hopefully that's helpful. And let's get started. So chapter one, the science of human development. You're gonna see me walking, kind of looking at my screen every now and then because I'm going along on this. What I'm gonna do with the PowerPoint too is I'll, I'll let you know as I'm moving. So we're looking at slide number two, um, the, the, the defining development is what it's called. And I'll kind of, I'll, I'll keep you up to date as we're moving through. So if you're following along, you'll have an easier time with that. 
Um, the science of human development. So it seeks to understand how and why people of all ages and circumstances change or remain the same over time. Uh, human development is going to be one of the big factors actually in most of psychology, right? The reason that most psychologists become psychologists is because they're curious why it is that humans do what it is that humans do. Specifically, most people that I've talked to that get into psychology, the reason they got into it is because they wanted to understand why they were different or why they were weird or why the heck it was that they did what they did. <laughs> it's going to be a fairly common theme actually with most psychologists and most psychology instructors and the like. Uh, you kind of get into it because it fascinates us, right? Like we, we, we want to understand what the heck it is that we do and why we do it. Um, and so that's why you do this. So let's get, we keep rolling. That's what this is essentially studying. It's just the, the development of humans, how we change, how we remain the same. Slide three, understanding how and why. So five basic steps of the scientific method. <clears throat> this is a science, right? We're not going to be, it's, there was a lot of debate early on in the night, up until about 1960s-ish. Um, on whether, where this should land. Should it land in the humanities, the social sciences, like, like history and all those kinds of things, or should it land in the sciences? Um, today, it is pretty firmly established that it lands in the sciences. So this is going to be alongside your, your biology and your uh, physics and chemistry and all those things, even though sometimes biologists and chemists and like kind of balk at that. Um, it uses the same methods that they do, just turned towards humans specifically rather than like you know, the, the, the matter of life or chemical construction and things like that. Um, same tools, same basic processes used in, in all these categories. Uh, so yes, it is technically a science. As far as academically, it's probably going to fall in the social science category, which might be why you're in this class because you need the social science filled up or whatever. But that's officially, it's actually a science. But there we go. So five basic steps of the scientific method. Begin with curiosity, right? Every single kid on the planet is born a little scientist. Um, we'll, we'll be looking at that as we as we get through these different ages. But we're curious. We want to know what makes things do what they do and why do they do what they do. Okay. Um, the what is what where the sciences work. The why maybe that's a little bit different. Maybe a more of a philosophy kind of a thing. But um, that's where it's going to start. Okay. Uh, from there. So you're basically, from that basic curiosity, you're going to be de developing theories, right? Ideas of what makes the world do what it does, and or people do what they do. Um, from that theory, we can then develop a hypothesis, which a hypothesis is a specific prediction that we can test. Okay, we're making a statement that is testable uh, to, to, to then basically put it to a trial to see if it actually works. Okay. Um, example, maybe I could say that, you know, I have a theory that if I drink too much caffeine, I feel jittery. Okay. So my hypothesis, is if I drink more than four cups of coffee in one sitting, um, it will make me feel jittery. Okay. <clears throat> so that's testable, right? I can sit down and drink four cups of coffee, right? One right after the other and see how I feel. That would be part of this thing. You test the hypothesis by doing that, by actually just sitting down and drinking the coffee, if I were to do that. Um, and then I draw my conclusions. If I were to sit down and drink four cups of coffee in one sitting without moving and anything, you know, uh, I, there's a pretty decent chance I'd be jittery, right? And I can, so I could say, okay, this is probably too much caffeine for me, at least in this short amount of time. Okay. Um, and then I would report the results. Okay. Maybe not in this case, because I'm just looking at myself, but if I was actually doing real research, right? If I'm, if I'm looking at like maybe how caffeine affects people with ADHD, um, or, uh, or the, the, the differences in how it affects different kinds of people and things like that. Okay. If I were doing that, and let's say I had a hundred people come in and I was doing a study with these hundred people and I had one group of people drink decaf and one group of people drink caffeine and I observed them and saw how they acted and if they acted differently and all these factors, um, I would then report that information for other people to be able to possibly replicate my research. Okay. Replication is an extremely important aspect of science because if you can't replicate it and if other people can't replicate the same information, right? They, they do the same thing that you did um, under relatively similar circumstances, but it doesn't, it comes out with a different result. Uh, that research, that original research isn't very good, basically. So let's say 100 people, 100 different groups do a similar study and 90 of them come out to be the same and 10 of them come out to be different. 
we can assume that the 90 are probably going to be the more accurate group, right? You get one of those, usually this is going to be the end result. Those tins might be kind of outliers that some, they maybe had some different factors in there or something that they didn't take care of that made it so it doesn't quite work. But we could say, you know, the statistics show that most of the time this works for most people. Okay. Um, this is all built on the scientific method, right? Question, hypothesis, test it, and then replication. Um, <clears throat> we're looking for possibilities. Um, we're also, the, we're, with this, we're going to be open-minded as far as looking at, you know, I might, I might go in with a hypothesis saying that this is going to work and then it turns out to be completely wrong, right? And in that case, I need to be humble enough to be able to accept that and uh, looking for the truth of how the world actually works. That's a very important part of science. If we're not actually looking for the truth, why do science? Okay. Next slide, slide four. At this rate, it's going to take a little while, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so slide four, a view from science. Are children too overweight? This is actually, um, let me see if I can find it real quick in the book. This is actually taken from the book uh, on page five. Uh, you, can, you can read the more detailed version of this. I'm actually going to leave it there, okay? I recommend reading this view from science um, that gives you a little bit more in-depth on this information. Essentially, what they found <coughs> was that uh, obesity in childhood doesn't necessarily play a role in health as an adult. Okay, it can. It can have an effect on upon it. Um, and so there was that. This is basically what this was debating and looking at. So. Okay, <clears throat> the next slide, slide five. The 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 pieces here are also found in the book. Um, they found that that uh, children who are normal weight and then not obese in adulthood, typically had fairly overall good health. Um, but they actually had, the, the, the people who had the best uh, overall results um, were children, or were people who are not obese as adults, but were overweight as children, interestingly enough. They, had, they actually have better uh, chance of, of not having diabetes, uh, hypertension, or basically heart attack. They have a less, little bit less chance of having a heart attack. Um, and, and high HDL, which is the bad kind of cholesterol, uh, they actually had the lowest levels of uh, high HDL or HDL cholesterol. So weird. So if you're a chubby kid and then you're thinned out as you got older, good for you. Um, <coughs> but anyway, that's basically what they what they found. The the, the big factor for health, but and once you when you do that, you can get more details. But again, but they found is that uh, the 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 overall body makeup of you as an adult is really what matters for adult health. Okay, next slide, slide six. The nature nurture question. This is gonna be a big debate. Actually, this isn't going to be. This is a big debate or has been a big debate within uh, various psychological schools. Nature is gonna be the influence of genes that we inherit. Okay, so nature is what you are, the, like, you know, those the egg and sperm come together and you got those 46 chromosome and your DNA and everything is present at that moment. <coughs> uh, that is going to be your nature. It's what is biologically programmed into you, the blueprint that is set in place. Nurture is gonna be the environment. So all the environmental influences that affect development. Okay, so nature is your biology, your physical stuff. Nurture is the effects of everything upon that biology. Epigenetics is how environmental factors affect genes and genetic expression, okay? Um, so various environmental factors can turn on or turn off genes. If you look at, at genes, I mean, you have over 20,000 genes in an average person. Um, they estimate between 20 and 23,000. But anyway, uh, those genes can be turned on and turned off. It's basically like off switches. And, and depending on the combination of them will, will result in the various complexity that we have in all of life. Okay. Um, so some envir environmental factors, let's say once you are born, right, and you're, you're moving through life, um, could be things like your overall health. You know, have you been exposed to different viruses or things like this? Um, your diet, like are you getting a good nutritious diet or are you eating like Twinkies all the time? Um, those things also can have an effect like what was the mother eating while she was pregnant with that person, okay? Um, the family structure and culture and environment will have an effect upon our biology, okay? Again, connected to the diet, but also how people treat us and things like that will actually affect how we work, how we are wired, the schooling that we are offered, the community that we grow up in, 
um, the society as a whole. All of these factors can have an effect, positive or negative, upon every individual. And so that's kind of that's basically what epigenetics is going to be looking at and studying is how are these different things affecting the the nature, the genes inherent within a person. Um, differential susceptibility is how environmental experiences differ because of particular inherited genes, right? Person A and person B are put in exactly the same situation. Person A gets through it really easily. Person B struggles uh, because of the genetic makeup that they were given. Okay, and that can be everything from like attitude to, to maybe you're more or less susceptible to different diseases because of how your immune system works. All of these factors uh, are going to be that differential susceptibility, right? That's why one person can slide through things easily, another person struggles, and then another person just, just bombs, right, or whatever. Um, all of those factors potentially in the same situation can be connected to our genes. It also may be connected to how we have been trained up to that point to deal with that given situation. But we'll look at that as we keep moving on um, throughout the semester. Okay, <clears throat> so seven, slide seven. Age ranges for different periods of development. Uh, this is gonna be basically how our chapters are gonna be broken down. There's gonna be approximately two chapters within each of these. First chapter actually, that isn't within this group, is pre-zero, right? Conception to birth. Um, then we have two chapters on infancy, which is approximately zero to two. And these are really rough numbers, okay? This is not like, oh, I've hit two, boom, it's done and, you know, on. Um, this is, this is, this just gives us kind of a ballpark what we're working with. But infancy is zero to two, approximately. Early childhood, two to six. Middle childhood, six to 11. Adolescence, 11 to 18. Emerging adulthood, which is actually a relatively new one that they've included um, just in the last 20 or so years. Uh, it, it's this idea of kind of an in-between adulthood and adolescence. Um, and we'll, we'll go more in depth on that. There's a whole chapter set aside just for that one because it's something newer. Um, even though it's relatively small, 18 to 25, um, it has a pretty big impact on society as well as the individuals who go through it. Um, adulthood, 25 to 65 now. Previously, adulthood was considered 18 to 65. So that's when the, where the changes happened. And then late adulthood, which is 65 years forward. Okay, if you make it to 100 or whatever, then you're still just in late adulthood. Um, so yeah, this is and this kind of just gives us, again, ballpark. It's not gonna be like set in stone. Some people can have uh, signs that you might see normally in like, you know, adolescence earlier or might not get through it until later. We'll look at all those as we move through each age group um, this semester. <clears throat> okay. All right. Slide eight, the lifespan perspective, part one. So these are gonna be some different ways of kind of seeing how we develop and how we move through our lives. Um, so development is multi-directional, right? Over time, human characteristics change in every direction, right? Our physical characteristics oddly change, like I was not born with a beard, right? Like, <laughs> that would've been weird. But the, uh, the, our, our physical change, we're gonna change, obvious, and those are more obvious to us, right? We grow taller, we grow, bigger and all those kinds of factors, right? Um, but we also have elements of our personality that change over time with, with experiences and, and, and different factors. These can result in us changing how we view and, per and perceive the world and as well as how we interact uh, with all the elements of the world. Okay, several major theorists describe discontinuous stages of development. So Freud, Erickson, and Piaget, um, Felt like there were basically like, you know, zero to one, this happens, this is what you're working with, and then something clicks and you turn a switch and now you're this to this age, to this age, so on and so forth. Um, we'll look at them more in depth here in a, in a little bit, but uh, but yeah, that's gonna be that stage. We got like stages that you move through and there's certain things that are gonna be happening in those given stages. Others view development as a continuous process. It's kind of a liquid or fluid, like a river flowing, right? Uh, this constant change that moves you through your lifespan. Next slide, slide nine, patterns of development growth. So these are gonna be some different possibilities of how this might look. No change, you just flatline, looks the same from birth to death, right? Uh, there's nothing, nothing alters whatsoever. Very, 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 very little, if any part of a human being has no change from conception or birth to death. Okay. Um, the Potential unpredictable is that yellow line that's kind of jaggedy there. Uh, 
You can also find this, I think, in the book. Just a second. Yeah, this is also found in the book on page nine. Slide nine, page nine. Um, <clears throat> that kind of jaggedy yellow line, though, that, that, uh, that you know, you don't know going to improve, just, you know, get worse or whatever. We don't know. Um, the green is going to be the growth in stages. That's going to be the Erickson, Piaget, Freud that has these, you know, stair-stepping up as we kind of make these big jumps suddenly in our development. Um, <clears throat> the red growth and decline, that's to some extent what you're going to see physically happen to us, right? As we move through life, we get better and better, better. We hit 25. 25 is actually our physical peak, basically. Um, everything is going to be working at its optimum at 25 or has the potential to work at its optimum at age 25. And then it's a slow decline after that. For all, of the, for all of us that are above 25, darn. But um, if you're under 25, take advantage of it. Anyway, um, so that's that one. And then the linear growth, where you just kind of have a consistent growth towards your ultimate end self. Um, the three that you're going to find that actually be the most consistent with uh, most people today are going to be that linear growth, the growth and decline, and the growth in stages. And in fact, most researchers today would give more weight to the linear growth and the growth and decline than to any of the others. The no change almost almost never happens. Unpredictable change is very rare, right? We can, we can get we can predict pretty well what we are going to see and, and what a person's going to do and all these things if we know where they are in their life. Okay. Um, so yeah. But anyway. The the uh, but it, and it, oh let well, I me mean, let me change this up a little bit the linear growth it it it's not going to be smooth okay it's also it's not going to be unpredictable but it's not going to be smooth um, so the the growth and decline growth and stages those are going to be different predictions and growth and stages Freud and Piaget and Erickson are still very much held in at the they they were pretty accurate interestingly enough. Um, especially Erickson and Piaget. Um, Erickson and Piaget are going to be two people that you're going to really want to pay attention to. If you're getting into nursing or the medical field, Erickson is going to be a, a very large part of what you need to know to understand how to work with people. Okay. Um, in fact, there are several aspects of the tests to become a nurse to get certified that will be dealing with Erickson stages. So make sure that you have a, a decent understanding of him and his eight stages of development as we move through life. Okay, and we'll like each each of these. We'll work with them as we get into each age group, um, looking at them more in depth. Slide ten: critical and sensitive periods. A critical period is a time when certain things must occur for normal development. If you don't do this thing at this time, it's going to cause issues. Basically, okay. A sensitive period is a time when a particular development occurs most easily. For example, a sensitive period would be um, language. Okay, before the age of seven. That is a sensitive period for language. We have an easier time learning languages before the age of seven. From seven onwards, it gets more and more challenging to pick up new languages, unless you've been exposed to new languages, multiple languages, in the first seven years of life. Okay, that'll make it easier. But even then, the, the mind becomes a little bit less flexible uh, in, in, in dealing with those areas of language specifically uh, later in life. Okay, and the older you are, the more difficult it becomes. Um, <clears throat> a critical period, let me see, what would be a good example of a critical period? Um, the crawling or walking, it's like there's a, there's a period where you need to learn how to do this. You can learn how to do it later, but it is not going to be able to reach its potential if you don't learn it by a certain point. Okay. And that's actually where, when we look at like infancy, we're going to be looking at some areas where it's kind of red flags. If you see these things not happening, um, it's a red flag that, they might need some help to make sure that it gets they get on track. Okay, uh, most of the time, there's there's not a whole lot of things that are like, like if they don't learn it at this point, they're just never going to learn it. Um, but it, it it will definitely make things easier if they are learned in that period. Even to trust people, infancy is actually the time. So zero to one years old is when we learn to trust people. Um, if things have happened to us that we have learned not to trust people in that first year of life. That's that critical period, right? We're going to have trust issues potentially for the rest of our life. Okay. Next slide. Slide 11. The lifespan perspective, part two. Development is multi-contextual. 
Um, lots of different context. <laughs> okay. And we know this, right? We, we, you look at, if you look at history and all these things, we can see that there was lots of differences in how people acted and, and reacted and things given the, the different environments that they were in. So historical context, cohort is going to be one of those aspects. Um, all persons born within a few years of one another are said to be a cohort, a group defined by the shared age of its members. So for example, if you were, say, age 10 uh, during the Great Depression, right? There's going to be certain traits of that cohort that grew up in that period that are going to have similar reactions to things, right? If you had grandparents that were, were raised in the uh, Great Depression era, you might have noticed, that, or great grandparents possibly, uh, <clears throat> you might have, you might notice a tendency towards hoarding, right? You like, I had a friend that his grandma, when she passed away, she had she had lived through the Great Depression, um, and we found like a drawer full of gum wrappers just in case, because she basically never threw anything away, just in case, right? You might need it. And with, in the depression, basically that taught her that you might not get it, even if you need it. So she was always prepared just in case, okay? Um, but it's gonna be those shared experiences that occurred at a critical point in time, usually when you were like 10-ish, okay? Give or take a couple of years on either side of you. Um, so like, you know, like people who went through 9-11 were like 10-ish. They all have a, a shift in their worldview that occurred similarly to each other. So they're going to be experiencing things now um, a little different than, than everything. So different critical times, different effects, but they all have that shared experience, the similarity. Okay. All right. Random fact number one. This is on the quiz. Violin bows are <coughs> commonly made from horsehair. If you're a musician... You probably already knew this, but or if you play, I guess, fiddle or, or, or cello or anything, you probably already know this. But yeah, violin bows, you actually use horsehair still to this day. Horsehair is the best material to make a good, fine bow for a violin. So, random fact. Okay. Moving on. 12. <clears throat> the Lifespan Perspective Part 3. Uh, ecological System Approach. Bronfenbrenner. So Bronfenbrenner is another guy that we're going to be visiting uh, off and on as we, we keep moving through. Um, but each person is affected by many social contexts and interpersonal interactions. Bon Bronfenbrenner, so, so Freud and Erickson look at life in stages as far as like this is what's happening in, you know, from zero to one and then from two to three and then, you know, so on and so forth or one to three or whatever. Okay. Um, but they are focused on kind of the, the, the developmental stages of what is what your needs are as an individual in the given stage and what you're learning that you'll be able to apply to later life. Piaget is curious what's going on inside the head. What are you capable of thinking? How is your brain processing information at a given age? And the stages and steps that basically pass you pass through. Um, Bronfenbrenner is, is more interested in how our, our social environment affects our individual development. Okay. <clears throat> so the interpersonal interactions, the, the interactions of you, the individual, with your family, your friends, your community, your education, all these things, are basically going to compile um, in, in Bronfenbrenner's theories and, and shape you to be the person that you become. Okay, so he said there's three nested levels surround individuals and affect them. We're going to have a picture here in just a second. If you're following in the book, it's on page 11 is going to be where the image is. And then we approach later named bioecological theory. So slide 13, the ecological model. <clears throat> So we have the developing person in the center. That's you, right? The individual or the person that you're thinking of or whatever. This is going to be that individual person. It's going to be their age. It's going to be their sex, their health, their abilities, their temperament. All the things that make the individual the individual, right? Their, their biological self, the nature of that person is there in the center. Then you have the micro system, the immediate direct influences. This is going to be your family, your school, your neighborhood, your friends, your peer group, your house of worship, if you have one, all of those factors are going to be the immediate things that have direct impact upon you, right? If you're raised Christian or Muslim or Buddhist or atheist or whatever, that's going to have a different effect upon you and it's going to shape your thinking differently <coughs> compared to, you know, compared to anybody else, right? Even if you're like, let's say we have a bunch of Christians, but you have like, you know, a Roman Catholic and an Orthodox and a Methodist and a Baptist and a uh, four square, whatever. Okay. Uh, one of the 30 something thousand different denominations. Um, they're all going to have slightly different worldviews. Okay. And that's going to affect the individual and how they interact with the world. 
So microsystem, <coughs> uh, elements of the person's immediate surroundings, family, peer group, everything. Exosystem is going to be a, a uh, the local institutions, such as schools and churches. Okay. Um, oops, I, I, actually, I skipped one. Sorry. Mesosystem. <coughs> the mesosystem um, is going to be your, your uh, actually, the mesosystem is basically kind of a, a bridge zone. Um, it's it's, a, it's a, a connecting point between the different systems. So this is where your microsystem, the individual immediate connections you have, interact with the exosystem. Okay, so the exosystem is local institutions such as schools and churches. Okay, um, again, so this is going to be the, the big differences there. It's not going to be the immediate hands-on individual things. It's going to be those bigger categories. Um, so the educational system that you grow in, not the specific school that you went to, but the system overall and what's shaping that school's philosophy. Um, your community structures, right? Somebody in America, <coughs> in Pueblo specifically, or in the, in the you know Southern Colorado region, it's going to be a little different in their in their uh, community structure compared to someone who grew up in Nicaragua or uh, main, mainland China or India or Nigeria or wherever. Okay, little different structures. Um, medical institutions, what things are available to you medicinally and all those kinds of things. Like you have good health care, do you have no health care? You have ridiculously overpowering health care, okay, all those kinds of things. Um, transportation systems, are you a walker? You know, do you do you have access to a bicycle? Do you have access to cars? Like Americans, everyone's got a car for the most part. Um, but you go to other countries and a lot of people don't, right? Or you go to some big cities in America and a lot of people don't because they're not practical. But anyway, that's gonna affect how kind of some different aspects of how we develop. Right, um, mass media, it's a big one. What are you watching? <clears throat> What's available to you? Are you watching TV all the time? You have no mass media? Are you only reading books maybe or magazines? Um, you know, do you, are you on social media all the time? Social media, man, it has a big effect on, on shaping people nowadays. Um, overall religious values beyond just this individual church that you're going to or, or you know, mosque or temple or whatever. Um, like what aspects of, of ethics and things like that are attached to it? Your understanding of, of, of the relationship potentially with, if there is a God, or with God and or the universe and or whatever, right? Um, all those things, again, are going to shape us. <clears throat> and then the macro systems, the larger social set, including cultural values, economic policies, and political processes uh, that basically govern you. Okay. All of these are going to be in the, within the chrono system, which chrono system is time, right? Chrono from the god Chronos, which is the god of time. Um, <clears throat> so the dimension of time. It evolves. All of these different aspects, including yourself, your individual self, are going to be changing and evolving over the course of time, right? America today looks significantly different than America when I was a kid, like for example. So the, our, my, my macro system, to some extent, has shifted significantly, which is impacting me differently than it did when I was a child. Okay, for just for one example. But um, yeah, so that's gonna be that's gonna be kind of what that is looking at. This is, again, um, Braun from Rainer's idea of kind of how he saw our development and how we became what we were. Okay, um, so just keep that in mind. When we talk about Braun from Rainer in the future, this will be something kind of like picture these rings and how they the impacts that they have upon us. You can look at it kind of as an out, you going out as well as out coming in to you. Okay. Slide 14. <clears throat> the lifespan perspective, part four. Development is multi-contextual. Socioeconomic context, right? Socioeconomic status or SES, income, wealth, occupation, education, neighborhood. All these things are taken into consideration for the socioeconomic status to some extent, or at least they should be, right? Um, but they all are going to be an impact in you. So if you're a first-generation college student, you're going to have a little bit different view than somebody whose parents graduated from college. Um, if you're a, you might not be a first-generation college student, maybe you have generations of people that went to college, but you live in poverty, you know, versus somebody who's wealthier. That's going to change how you view the world. Um, <clears throat> maybe you have a job that makes, you know, hundred thousand dollars a year. Maybe you have a job that makes forty thousand dollars a year. All those variants will will affect the development of you as the individual as well as you the impacting of your family and all those things. Okay. Poverty is traditionally related to food costs and family size. So what they basically look at is the cost that it, that it, what, it would, what it takes to feed your family 
and they estimate where that poverty line is. Um, thus, thus, you know, an individual, a single person as an adult, <clears throat> the poverty line is pretty low. Whereas if you have like a family of like 12, you know, suddenly you could be making $70,000 and still be considered in poverty. Um, which is fairly accurate. It'd be very expensive to feed a family of 12. But uh, <clears throat> there's, there has been a, a some debate on whether or not this is actually an accurate depiction, right? So a revised definition of poverty might also take into account like housing. Somebody in Southern Colorado uh, where housing is cheaper compared to like somebody say like in Denver, right? So somebody could be making more money in Denver but have to live at a lower level of quality because it's more expensive to live in that environment. Or if you live in California, like I have family who lives in California, sheesh, right? Compared to my family who lives like in Missouri, or Arkansas, Louisiana, where the land's a little cheaper and the living costs are a little bit lower. So housing, medical care, um, various subsidies, right? Do you have subsidies available to you uh, to basically kind of fill in the gaps? All of those things are beginning to be taken into account when you're looking at poverty. Because um, in some cases, somebody could be technically you know, financially living in poverty, but their quality of life is higher because everything else around them is, it doesn't cost as much. So, okay, <clears throat> next slide. You move a little bit faster, otherwise it's gonna take you a very long time to watch this video. Sorry about that. Um, lifespan, pers lifespan Perspective Part 5. Development is multi-cultural. So culture is a system of shared beliefs, norms, behaviors, and expectations that persist over time and prescribe social behavior and assumptions, right? Cultures in the past would live, potentially wouldn't change for hundreds, even thousands of years. Um, today, culture changes a little bit faster because of our exposure to more and more things worldwide. Um, social construction is based on shared perceptions, not on objective reality. And this is gonna be something important to look at with culture. Culture is not necessarily a reality as far as like, this is how the world works. Culture is a thing that has that we have adopted and shared that we have agreed upon that basically has shaped us into it, right? So the culture you are raised in, if you're here in Southern Colorado, there's going to be certain elements of our culture that is different compared to people who are raised in California, even right. We're all in the United States, but the cultures in those various, well, even to some extent, Southern Colorado compared to Northern Colorado has slightly different cultures, right? Different views of how, what makes the world do what the world does, so. Um, here, here we go. Vygotsky described an interaction between culture and education. Right, Vygotsky was going to be looking at, at those those factors. We're going to look at Vygotsky here in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> many age-related terms such as childhood, adolescence, yuppie, senior citizen, social construction—all these things, um, all basically, all these things are social constructions. Right. If I say a hippie, it probably paints a picture in your head of a, what kind of a certain type of person. Um, that is a social construction, right? A hippie is a certain cultural thing that I we have created as a social construction. Okay, the same if I say redneck or whatever, okay. Slide 16, lifespan perspective part six, development is multicultural, so uh, deficit or just difference? This is a big one. Uh, this is a this is a there's a strong tendency towards thinking that if something is different It must be worse than what we are right humans tend to believe that they their nation and their culture are a little better than others Difference equals deficit error. <clears throat> this is a this is a fallacy basically in our thinking This is what leads a kid uh, If you have you, know, if you have little kids and their friends come over and you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich And you set it down in front of them. and They're like this isn't a, like you don't know how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich Because you didn't cut it right right like my mom cuts it in squares and you cut it in triangles and that's wrong. Okay. No, it's just different. It's not wrong. It's different unless you really like, you might be like, I'm obsessive about it or something, but it's a cultural construct, right? It, you, it's something that we have imposed upon it. That is not actually connected to reality. <clears throat> um, so that's essentially what we do at a bigger scale when we, when we compare ourselves to other cultures. Now, there are some cases where something might actually be objectively better or worse given different circumstances, but most of the time, it's, it's not necessarily, right? Now, if they're like doing like something like cannibalism or something, then maybe you'd be like, well, eh, that's probably not as good as something that it doesn't, but anyway, that's <laughs> we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole. So belief becomes destructive if it reduces respect and appreciation for others, and that's gonna be a big factor there, right? Um, I need to I need to be basically respecting them as a human being and as an individual. 
um, to some extent, accepting their, not accepting, but respecting their beliefs and kind of how they see things. Um, and potentially just engaging them even in, in, in dialogue, just kind of figure out why they think what they think. Okay. Um, differences may be assets or deficits. And so that's, that's up really for the individual to kind of try to figure that one out. Right. Um, so one person thinks that this is, you know, super important and the person's like, ah, eh, it doesn't really matter. Um, but when it went, you know, or, or maybe like a cultural thing, like using chopsticks could be super useful and things like that. But in America, we use fork and knife instead. Potato, potato, right? One's better, one's bet, one's not, whatever. Individual things might be better or not. But anyway, that's that's going to be what that's looking at. We don't judge people because they use something different. We, use, we judge it whether or not it's actually effective or not. Okay, 17. Lifespan Perspective, Part 7. Development is multicultural. So learning with the culture of Vygotsky. So Vygotsky uh, <coughs> is a, a, a key player, actually, in, in understanding our development. At least today, some of his thinking what has has definitely made it into present day. He shows up on page seventeen if you're following along in the book. Um, he described interaction between culture and education. So he felt like education was actually super important because education essentially is the means to teach culture, right? So he proposed that guided participation is a universal process used by mentors to teach cultural knowledge, skills, and habits. Your first mentors are your parents. And they're going to be the ones who basically shape and teach you how to interact with society, good, bad, ugly. Okay, however they might do that. And then your, your, your additional educators are going to be maybe uncles and aunts, um, grandparents, your, your immediate friends and, and people around you, actual teachers, religious leaders, pol politicians. All of these people are to some extent going to be mentors that are helping to shape who you become. Okay. Um, yeah, Vygotsky, this is a picture of him with his daughter. Um, <clears throat> he lived from 19, or 1896 to 1934, um, where he was, unfortunately was, was, was killed uh, due to the uh, political turmoil and like he got caught in it and, and was killed. Um, but he had a deep love for children. He loved his own kids uh, greatly, and he was really wanting to figure out how to basically give the best environment for a child to truly flourish in. 18, Lifespan Protective Part 8, development is multicultural, ethnic, and racial groups. Ethnicity is an important and use, useful term. Okay. Social, it's a social construction still. It's affected by social context, not a direct outcome of biology. Okay. Your ethnic group basically should, if I'm, if I'm talking about like someone ethnic group, um, it's going to give me an idea of kind of where you're from. Right, so it consists of people whose ancestors were born in the same region and who often share a language, culture, and religion. <clears throat> if I learn your background, like if I learn you're from Ireland and you've been in Ireland for generations, okay, it's going to give me an idea of kind of who you are and how you see the world to some extent. If I learn that you're Irish Catholic, that's going to give me more knowledge, right, or, or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, right. That's going to be that's going to be your ethnic group. Race is a little bit less useful. Um, <clears throat> social construction also typically continues to lead to racism because essentially what race looks at is your skin color, and that's it. So ethnic group, right? Uh, you could have the same skin color and be from very different ethnic backgrounds. If I took somebody from Norway, somebody from Ireland, somebody from Poland, and somebody from Russia, okay. Um, they, 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 they might look relatively the same. Their race is the same. Their ethnic groups are very different. Okay. And that's what that's looking at. Um, so, yeah. We're, we're, skin color and basic first appearances don't, make, don't really make that much difference, right? It, what really matters is your, 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 where you're from. And it only matters as far as my, my trying to understand you. Right. Like my, my, my ethnic group, <clears throat> if you go back far enough, I'm, I'm Scotch, Irish, uh, Norwegian, Portuguese, a little bit of Comanche, a little bit of Choctaw, um, mixed in there. Right. That's my, that's my bloodline. If you go back, <clears throat> my ethnic group though, is basically lower, uh, lower middle-class rural American. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, 
if you want to know who I am, that, that's where I come from. And so that's, that, that's kind of the better way to understand me. Uh, my skin color doesn't really have that much to do with that. Okay. So next slide. <clears throat> this is a lifespan perspective, part nine. Stop and consider the fight to fight racism must race be named and recognized. I'm going to leave you with that one. I, I'm not going to leave you, leave you, but I want you to think about that one a little bit um, and consider that question on for yourself, right? Um, is racism connected to just the word race, right? And how does that affect us? With that, we're also gonna give you a random fact. Number two, people who post their fitness routine on social media are statistically more likely to, to have psychological problems than who people who don't. Random fact, right? So if you post your if you post your workout stuff and fitness routines on social media, ooh, maybe you maybe you've got other issues. No, not really. Well, maybe, but anyway, doesn't really matter. <clears throat> Random weird fact. This statistically speaking, it gives you a higher chance of it. So not a guarantee, not a cause, just a just a result of basically. All right, lifespan, so slide 20, lifespan perspective part 10, development is plastic. This is super important to understand if you really want to understand humans. Um, plasticity, so plastic doesn't mean, I'm not meaning like plastic, like, like you know, like this mouse is plastic. Uh, when I'm talking about plastic, I'm talking about the, the, the malleability, the flexibility, the ability to change and, and warp the thing, right? Silly putty or Play-Doh is very plastic. It's very changeable in its shapes. Concrete, on the other hand, is not, right? Concrete, once it's once it's set, it might be relatively plastic when it's liquid, but once it has set, it has become very rigid, and that's the opposite of plasticity. Humans and our thinking <coughs> and our development is extremely plastic all the way through the entire lifespan. Um, and that's important to recognize, right? Less than 100 years ago, people thought that basically once you hit like 16, 17, you essentially locked up like concrete and you were now you were just who you were right you can't teach an old dog new tricks kind of a thing um then they said 25 they said at 25 that's when you actually get set right they, they, the brain stops developing and that's just it you're just you're just kind of declining up to that point what they found is basically since then that's not true um we are constantly changing constantly shifting ourselves and growing to some extent and improving um all the way to death so we are very plastic so simultaneity incorporates two facts. People can change over time. In fact, people do change over time. And new behavior depends partly on what has already happened. The experiences that we have in our background and everything will help to shape who we become. That's it. Okay. Uh, 21, lifespan perspective, part 11. <clears throat> Dynamic system approach suggests human development is an ongoing, ever-changing interaction between body and mind and between the individual and every aspect of the environment. Highlights how developmental changes change has always occurred. Okay. Um, pretty straightforward, right? Uh, we're, 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 we're basically going to be shifting and changing, um, just like a river moving through, right? You might be sitting at one spot of the river and watching it, but that water is constantly changing. That's basically the same thing with us. Um, so, okay, next slide. We're going to kind of move a little faster with this. 22, theories of human development, part one, the developmental theory. <clears throat> Systematic statement of principles and generalizations, a framework for understanding how and why people change as they grow older. So I mentioned Freud, Erickson, Piaget, Vygotsky, and all these guys. They had developmental theories, right? These are theories of why we change over time. Um, and that's essentially what we're gonna be looking at next. So give me just one second. All right, I am back. So 22, we just got developmental theory, right? Um, so now we're gonna take a look at some of these different theories. So starting with 23. Theories of Human Development, Part 2, <laughs> Psychoanalytic Theory. Now, psychoanalytic theory actually is what most people think about when they picture psychology, right? If you picture an old dude with a white beard <laughs> smoking a cigar with a with a pad of paper in front of him, and he's sitting there, and there's a person laying on the couch over here saying, you know, I think that this and this, and I feel this and that, and he's like, oh, interesting. What does it, you know, how do you feel about your mother? Okay, that's psychoanalytic theory, and that's directly from Freud. So the theory proposes 
that irrational unconscious drives and motives often originating in childhood underlying human underlie human behavior um, this is this was this actually was a breakthrough thing so Freud um, he was the first psychoanalyst right uh, born 1856, died in 1939 of jaw cancer. He actually smoked a lot of cigars. He didn't give himself jaw cancer. He, uh, it was over 10 years that he struggled with jaw cancer before he eventually committed suicide um, through through lethal injection. But uh, too much pain, basically, for his uh, for it. But the 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 <clears throat> but yeah, first psychoanalyst. He's the one that basically came up with the theory. Um, what, sorry, I'm hearing a little noises in the background. One of the problems with working from home. But anyway, um, one of the, uh, one of the big influences for him. So basically Freud, before he became a, a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, he was a medical doctor. Um, one of his, uh, one of the other people that are in his same field had a woman who, uh, upper middle class woman, she was chronically ill. No one could cure her. And one day, the guy just finally asked her, when did this start? <clears throat> okay. And the woman began to share about her life. Over the course of time, some different things came out, like she was she was abused and all these different things came out. Um, but as she was speaking about all these different things that had happened in her life, her symptoms began to fade. And actually, over the course of a year, um, the woman was completely cured without the doctor doing anything other than listening. And this intrigued Freud. So Freud came up with this idea that maybe there was something in us, there was something that was kind of, and, and a lot of this stuff had come out like she, she had forgotten about it over time. Um, but as she spoke about it, it came forward into her conscious thought where she was able to then express it and then it got forward. Um, that's really what drives Freud then, okay? This idea of the unconscious mind, the idea of, of a, or a subconscious mind, okay? Um, before Freud, the, a subconscious mind wasn't a thing. There was no idea that this was a thing that was driving us. It would have been like me basically saying, like, there's a little green guy that sits on the back of your head and no one can see him, <clears throat> but he, he basically is there holding information and he like whispers it into your ears every now and then and lets you know. That's, that's essentially the same kind of reaction Freud initially got. Um, probably part of the reason why you can see that like Freud's success is in fact the fact that we use terminology like subconscious without even really hardly thinking about it nowadays. Like it has, it has completely infiltrated our society and our thinking. But um, for human growth and development side of things, he felt like there was five uh, psychosexual stages. So one of Freud's things you're gonna learn about, or, or if you learn about Freud, you're gonna learn about is, is he has the, the id, the ego, and the superego, right? The id is basically your animal instincts, your, your desires, okay? He tied this to sexual energy, is what he felt like it was, which is why Freud, a lot of, a lot of times Freud kind of gets, um, people overemphasize his sex stuff, even though he he did have a lot of sex stuff. Um, he, he felt like sex, like basically the libido, another Freudian term, was a driving factor um, in, in basically what made us do everything that we do, right? We, we were looking for pleasure. So the id is the part of the brain that says, I want a cookie, and that's as far as it goes. Most toddlers are pretty much driven by ids, right? They, they have desires and that's what they want and that's all they want, okay? The superego shows up later. Superego is our parental voice, he said. Uh, and this essentially is like the police officer or the, the principal. This is the thing that, that keeps the, the, the id in check, okay? So the id says, I want a cookie. The superego says, no, you already had three. You don't need another cookie, okay? Um, <clears throat> The ego then is actually our experience of self that lies between the id and the superego. Okay, like crash course in Freud. Okay, um, <clears throat> so he feels like there's five different stages that are based around this psychosexual uh, drive. Okay, um, during which sensual satisfaction is linked to developmental needs and conflicts. Um, so it basically is connected to where do we derive our pleasure in a given stage. For example, Freud felt like in the very first stage in infancy, um, our, it's the, the oral stage. It's essentially we derive our pleasure from our mouth. So we derive most of our pleasure from like breastfeeding. Um, he felt like he was very anti-bottle. We'll talk about that when we get there. But he felt like breastfeeding and, and basically this is also why babies, as soon as they pick up anything, once they get the motor skills to pick up something, they jam that thing in their mouth because that's how they basically explore the world. 
depending on how well you pass through these five stages, will determine how well you function as an adult. For example, if you have an oral fixation, okay, um, <clears throat> this could lead to issues like um, if you have a drinking problem, or if you have a smoking problem, or if you have an eating disorder, or if you can't stop talking, or if you're a chronic liar, and all these things basically he would tie to issues that had occurred in that first stage of infancy, the oral stage. Okay, uh, We'll explore these more in depth as we get into each stage or age uh, throughout. But So he suggests early conflict resolution determines personality patterns, essentially. Um, and this was derived originally from his thinking with connected to his a colleague who has also um, basically kind of stumbled on this idea of, of helping people through talk. Okay, it's enough for Freud for now. We're gonna we're, we'll keep on coming back to Freud throughout this whole semester. But um, more importantly, Erickson. So slide twenty four, theories of human development, part three, psychoanalytic theory. <coughs> Eric Erickson, born in nineteen o two, died in nineteen ninety four. Good long life. Um, Erickson was a student of Freud. And originally actually like one of Freud's favorite students until Erickson disagreed with Freud at which point Freud basically disowned him and it was like ah, I don't want nothing to do with you like, like you know kind of craziness, but um, Eric Erickson uh, Built off of Freud's ideas Okay um, Let's see. you can find this information. Too. There's, there's more information on both these guys and their basic theories in your book Page 23, you're going to find a table of comparison of Freud's ideas and, and um, Erickson's. So Freud has five, Erickson has eight. Okay, that's going to be um, one of the big things. Um, Freud feels like everything is driven by sexual pleasure. Okay, not necessarily sexual pleasure, but pleasure in general, right? The libido, that, that pleasure-seeking part of us that also drives us towards sexuality. Um, Erickson felt like we were, we were actually uh, socially driven rather than pleasure driven. And that difference is big. He also gives eight instead of five. So uh, Freud basically feels like once you hit adolescence, that's the last stage and that's the stage that you're in for the rest of your life. Okay. Um, Erickson recognizes that in fact, adolescents and adults are quite a bit different. And in fact, there are different stages within adulthood that can occur. Uh, and so he has eight. The, uh, <clears throat> we're, again, we'll dig into these more in depth as we go throughout the, the semester. Um, but it's, it's important to note that they're, he's driven from Freud with slight differences, but they're, they're the first five stages age range wise are pretty much identical, um, throughout. So you have birth to one year, one to three years, three to six years, six to 11 years, adolescence, and then Erickson adds on adulthood, um, for the multiple stages there. Okay. Um, so yeah. I'm going to leave it there. We'll, like I said, we'll, we'll dig into each of those. Look at, look through it in the book though. Page 23. Again, there's the table. Um, kind of get a feel for those, the, the five stages of Freud and the eight stages of Erickson. Uh, there's all kind you can look up YouTube stuff. There's all kinds of videos on how to memorize and stuff. I don't necessarily need you to memorize it for this class. Uh, but I do need you to have the kind of that basic understanding of, of what these are going to look like. And we'll go more in depth as we go. So, okay. <clears throat> Slide 25. Before we actually read slide 25, random number fact number three. <clears throat> random number that fact. Random fact number three. There we go. There is a underwater version of rugby called underwater rugby. Like that's not actually that impressive, but <laughs> there's an underwater version of rugby. Um, it's a full contact sport that involves free diving, meaning you dive by holding your breath and you have to try to score with this ball underwater. It looks rough, but anyway. Rugby's rough anyway, but underwater version of it. So underwater rugby. Um, it's worth a peek at YouTube if you want to see it. Anyway, theories of human development, part four, slide 25. Behaviorism. <clears throat> so Freud and Erickson are going to be the primary guys 1920s forward, okay, until 1960s, basically. Um, behaviorism is a, a school of thought that kind of tracks alongside them. Same time period. Okay. Also developed, uh, had a massive amount of impact on society. Um, behaviorism actually had a very heavy impact on, on the United States uh, educational system. To this day, our educational system is based off of behaviorism's thinking. Okay, good, bad, ugly, whatever. It's just, that's what it is. Okay, so uh, it's a learning theory. 
focuses on observer observable behavior, describes the laws and processes by which behavior is learned. Basically what behaviorism, so Freud, one of the one of the criticisms of Freud to this day is that Freud was not very scientific. Basically he was very intuitive in how he processed and, and approached his material. Um, behaviorism wanted to reject that. So behaviorism essentially uh, moved away from that intuitive, like it seems like this is how it is. And really what they wanted to look at is what could they measure? Okay, so they're, they're, they're pushing psychology more in the direction of science and away from this kind of intuitive, touchy-feely side. Um, so what they're looking at is, is, is basically data in, information going into the individual, and then what are the results from that information coming in. Okay. So conditioning is going to be a big factor in behaviorism. Conditioning proposes that learning takes place through processes by which responses become linked to particular stimuli. Um, I think we're going to look at Pavlov here in just a sec. Yep, Pavlov is coming up, so we're going to, I'm going to hold on to that. So keep that in mind. Conditioning is a, it proposes that learning takes place through processes by which responses become linked to particular stimuli. You see a lightning flash and you find yourself flinching a little bit because you're, you're anticipating the boom of the thunder. You've been conditioned to wince because you know that the big bang is coming from the lightning flash. Okay. Um, if you've been around weaponry, if you're you know, a veteran or, or just been around weapons like guns and stuff, um, you can get trigger shy. I mean, especially if you fired some two guns that are a little bit too big for maybe what you're comfortable with, where you flinch really bad in anticipation of the gun kicking in your hands. Okay, that is a conditioned response. And even if the gun's empty, you still are like blah, blah, waiting for it to, to go because you've been conditioned to expect that that hard kick into the shoulder. Okay, or out of, in, if you're shooting like a desert eagle or something, hurt your wrists. <clears throat> so that that can do that. <clears throat> okay. Those are, those are some elements of conditioning. There's two types of conditioning. <clears throat> we'll look at those in just a second. So behaviorism, John Watson is gonna be one of the first guys to kind of get this rolling. Um, he was born in 1878, died in 1958. He's an American psychologist, one of the earliest proponents of behaviorism and learning theory, okay? <clears throat> he argued that science, scientists should examine only what they could observe and measure, which is kind of the, the driving force behind behaviorism. Um, he proposed that anything can be learned with focus on behavior. He actually took this to fairly extreme levels. They, they really, the behaviorists in this period really did feel like they, they could train you to do anything. Okay. Um, Skinner, B.F. Skinner was a, a behaviorist that basically, uh, he wrote a book, terrifying book. He felt like it was a utopia. It sounds like a dystopia to me. But, uh, but basically the government gets the, gets when the child is born, the government takes them immediately and begins to train them to be the perfect whatever. So you have like perfect soldiers and you have perfect doctors and perfect teachers and perfect leaders. And they've been trained from birth through through conditioning to be the perfect whatever you want them to be. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're going to look at a lot, but we'll look, dig into those much more in depth a little later on. We'll keep on looking here in a second though. Um, slide 27, Theories of Human Development, Part 6, Behaviorism, Classical Conditioning, um, Ivan Pavlov. So Pavlov was not a psychologist. Pavlov was a biologist. Um, he actually won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work on, uh, uh, of, of looking at, well, it's right here, 1904, he, uh, his work on digestive processes, his research on dogs' digestive systems essentially is what got him his Nobel Prize. Um, but during his research in the digestive system, he stumbled upon classical conditioning. Um, and, and this is a famous one. You might have heard of Pavlov's dogs. Uh, so he was working with dogs. One of the things that he did was he actually, he, he, he basically uh, cut into the dog's saliva glands uh, and hooked up a, a tube so that when the dog would salivate, it would go into a tube and he could measure how much uh, saliva was produced by the dog in a given situation. Um, where, what he stumbled on for the conditioning for the classical conditioning was that his dogs, he had a, he had a specific assistant that would always give the dogs their, their food. He gave them meat powder basically that would cause a lot of salivation and it allowed them to, to measure that. Well, his, his assistant had a very unique way of walking. <clears throat> and one day he had his dogs hooked up to the machine and he was wait, waiting for the assistant to come give them the food so they could start measuring the, the salivation. When the dogs heard the assistant walking towards them, they began to salivate, and there was nothing there that should have caused them to salivate. Okay. This intrigued Pavlov, and so he began experimenting. And he actually got to where he could, he could, 
he could learn that he or he learned that he could condition dogs to salivate to various stimulation okay um, such as a bell ringing right he would ring a bell and then he'd give them food and he'd ring a bell and he'd give them food and he'd ring a bell and he'd give them food and then pretty soon he could ring the bell and they begin to salivate as if there were food present even if there was no food present their mind had made a link between the stimuli of a bell ringing and the food being offered okay this is classical conditioning um, it demonstrates that behaviors can be learned by making an association between environmental stimulus and naturally occurring stimulus. Okay, um, it's also called respondent conditioning. <clears throat> but the the thing here is that you know eventually you ring the bell enough times that there was no food offered, they'd stop salivating. Their brain would disconnect the, those those two the stimulation and the and the food, um, the unconditioned stimulus. But um, but okay, this was a breakthrough in kind of being able to understand what maybe is working inside us to some extent. Okay. <clears throat> all right. There's a helicopter coming. I don't know if you can all hear it. Ooh, a couple Blackhawks. Okay. Um, 28. Interesting. They're flying low, too. Sorry. Okay. 28. Theories of Human Development, Part 7. So behaviorism still. Operant conditioning was discovered by B.F. Skinner. Um, you might have heard of a thing called a Skinner box, but it was an experiment that B.F. Skinner came up with that would allow him to, to uh, measure the, the uh, operant conditioning of a given thing. So, operant conditioning is a learning process in which a particular action is followed either by something desired or something unwanted, making the action either more or less likely to be repeated. Okay, so classical conditioning is completely out of your own control. Okay. You can classically condition anyone, as, assuming it's something relatively easy to, to associate. So usually things like, like salivating is relatively easy to condition into somebody. Um, you can actually even do it to yourself as if you want to do a fun experiment. You take lemonade or something like some kind of sour or sweet uh, powder that makes your tongue salivate really bad. Like ring a bell and take like lick, like country time lemonade or something like, like lick it and stick it in your mouth. Okay. And ring a bell and do the same thing and ring a bell and do the same thing. Give yourself a little bit of time in between each time, but you know, over the course of 10, 15 minutes, you do this and um, you're going to be, you'll, you'll be conditioned. When you ring the bell, your mouth will salivate as if you had just put lemonade in your mouth um, over the you know, five, six, seven times of trying it. You can uncondition yourself by just ringing the bell over and over again and eventually you'll stop salivating. Operant conditioning, you actually have some control over. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is going to be like, you see the lightning flash and you flinch. Okay, this is operant conditioning because I could choose not to flinch, but it's gonna be a more natural inclination because I'm preparing my body for that boom that I expect to be coming. Okay, learning to, to like trigger, when you get the trigger shy, same kind of a thing, this is operant conditioning. Uh, if your dog sits when you say sit and you give them a treat, you are conditioning them with operant conditioning. They associate the action of sitting, and after they've heard the word sit, with a treat that will be following thereafter. Okay, so 1904 to 1990, B.F. Skinner was around, um, inspired by Pavlov. He was best known for experiments with rats, pigeons, and his own daughter, which is a little disturbing. Um, but he, again, he felt like through conditioning, you could basically make people perfect. Okay, she had some issues later on in life, but... <clears throat> so it was far from it. He, he didn't, the, the complexity of humanity is a little bit out of their league, essentially. Um, but with rats and pigeons, he was very successful. Uh, he, he taught pigeons how to read. Like they'd read the word left and they would look to the left or read the word right and they'd look to the right through that. And then they'd get treats for if they did the right thing and all these different things. So, um, so yeah, interesting stuff. Slide 29. Theories of Human Development, Part 8. Um, social learning theory is an extension of behaviorism that emphasizes that other people influence each person's behavior. Um, this is actually going to be the, the stuff that your paper is going to be over in this class. Um, so social learning theory is it's a kind of a side category of behaviorism um, created by Albert Bandura or invented or discovered, I guess you could say, by Albert Bandura, um, born in 1925. Uh, I heard just recently passed away, <coughs> which is kind of a sad thing. He was writing right up until the end. He's literally been writing books um, well into his 90s. Um, and so yeah, I heard he, I guess he just, what I heard he just passed away this last summer. But um, I haven't confirmed that, but I'll throw it out there. 
So <clears throat> extensional behaviorism proposes that even without specific reinforcement, every individual learns many things through observation and imitation of other people. Monkey see, monkey do. Okay, modeling is going to be what this is connected to. Um, so basically, this is going to be like, you know, a kid sees another kid do something and they get a prize. The kid's like, oh, that's a good thing to do, right? On the other hand, a kid sees another kid do something and they get punished for that thing. And they're like, okay, make sure that I don't either don't do that or don't get caught doing that. Um, and the, through that, they're, they're going to be shaping and kind of looking at what's proper and what's not. They're also going to be, this is also why, like, if you've ever had a kid that really liked you, okay, um, maybe you're an uncle or aunt or something like that, or like your friends have kids or you have your own kids and they're really like, for some reason, connected to you really deeply. Um, <clears throat> it's usually somebody outside of the house is a little bit more obvious. But you do something or say something or act some way, and that kid basically does and, and says and acts exactly like you during that time. Okay. This is this is social learning theory in action. They're 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 gonna imitate you to, to basically because they 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 see you as somebody who is worth imitating. They're like, I want to be like this person. This person seems like a good model, so therefore. I'm going to connect to them. Okay. Um, Albert Bandura, again, 1995, first described social learning theory, um, emphasized the influence that other people have over a person's behavior. Albert Bandura, one of the, his most famous uh, experiments was the Bobo doll experiment. We will look at that once we get a little bit further on and through the lifespan. But that was going to be one of the big factors um, for all of this. So keep on rolling. <clears throat> Slide 30. Theories of Human Development Part 9, Cognitive Theory, proposes that thoughts and expectations profoundly affect actions, attitudes, beliefs, and assumptions. Cognitive theory was first introduced as an as a idea um, in the middle mid of the century. So this is after Freud and all these guys had already set their ideas in place. Jean Piaget uh, proposes this idea that the mind is basically capable of certain levels of thinking um, at certain ages. Okay, so it focuses on changes in how people think over time. So what is the difference between an infant and a three-year-old and an eight-year-old and a 15-year-old and how they process the information that comes into them? <clears throat> so Jean Piaget, uh, 1896 to 1980, maintained that cognitive development occurs in four major age-related periods or stages. Um, sensory motor, which is the earliest stage in, in our life, uh, pre-operational, which is going to be what you're working on before you can, can like talk. Okay. Um, concrete operational. This is going to be early to middle childhood and then formal operational, which generally occurs roughly at the same time as uh, adolescence begins. Okay. You might see signs of it before that, but usually like 11 ish, 12, you'll start to really see it be beginning to be a thing. Um, he stressed that intellectual advancement occurs throughout life because humans seek cognitive equilibrium. Essentially, what causes us to do what we do is because we're constantly looking for, for um, we like balance in ourselves. So if you get some new information, you're going to do one of a couple of options. Okay. Um, if it totally goes against everything that you already believe, you're going to have to either do one of two things. You're either going to have to figure out a way to make it fit in with how you already view the world. You're going to have to reject it, just throw it away. Okay. That idea makes me uncomfortable. Boop. Throw it out, okay. Or uh, possibly you're going to have to basically throw out some things that you've already held to, or reshape them in order to make this piece fit, okay. As that piece is entering, it's uncomfortable. We don't like it, and because of that, we have to basically struggle with it. And this is what causes us, though, this stress and this discomfort is what causes us to essentially advance in our ability to think and process new information. You're going to find information about him and, and kind of his four stages on page 27 within the book. So if you're following along again in the book, um, you'll see it there. Okay. All right. Slide 31. So again, there's those four stages. Sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, form operational. Take time to learn the age range, characteristics, and major gains of each period. Um, so this first period is going to be from zero to two, right? The sensory motor. Two to six for pre-operational. Um, and then six to 11 ish, give or take for concrete operational and then 12 year old and above for formal operational again, give or take. Okay. I've met some 13, 14 year olds that are still very much in the concrete operational, but they, they might be beginning to show the operation or formal operational. I've also met like nine year olds who are starting to show some signs of formal operational. Um, 
It's not set in stone. It's just going to be a, a guideline for roughly the ages that you're going to see these things occurring. Okay. Okay. Theories of Human Development, Part 10, Cognitive Theory, Assimilation. So these are going to be some of the different ways that we deal with new information. Assimilation is experiences uh, are interpreted to fit into or assimilate with old ideas. Right? A new experience occurs or a new bit of information comes to you, and you figure out you can make it fit with what you've already got. Accommodation is old ideas are restructured to include or accommodate for the new experiences. You have to actually rework how you see the world and interact with the world in order to make this new information um, come in. Okay. Um, other option is just to basically reject the new information. Those are essentially the three ways that we're going to handle any kind of new information coming into us or new experience. Um, that we are experiencing. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Slide 33, Theories of Human Development, Part 11. Um, evolutionary theory. <clears throat> this is actually kind of an older one. Um, William James is one of the first psychologists. He's kind of, Freud is kind of considered like the father of modern psychology. Um, William James is considered the grandfather of modern psychology. And he was very much influenced by, or by, by Darwin and Darwin's thinking. Evolutionary theory basically is kind of re-going re back to what he had said and, and bringing it forward. Um, so it suggests that organisms change over time as a result of changes in heritable, physical, or behavioral traits. We adapt to our environment, essentially is what it's saying. Charles Darwin theorized nature works to ensure that each species does two things, survive and reproduce. And that's essentially what, at its base, is what driving most people is what they would say. Okay. Whether or not that's true, that's a that's up for debate, and that's why it's a, it's a, it's 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 a theory or, of of how to deal with psychology. But it is to some extent true, right? <clears throat> Our, the things that are going to allow us to get to the age where we can reproduce are going to make us if we if we have that chance, our genes are more likely to get into the future. Okay, um, thus our our genetic code is going to get passed on, and those traits will be passed forward into our into our descendants. Um, if you don't, if it gets in the way and you end up dying, then you're less likely to survive and therefore you're less likely to get your genes into the future and so therefore, eh, it's, you're, it's over. Okay. <laughs> okay. 34. Well, and all of these again, we'll keep touching on these as we go uh, throughout the semester. So 34, the scientific method part one, scientific observation. So we're changing gears. Those are the theories of kind of how, how psychologists deal with this stuff. Um, now we're changing into the overall scientific method. Um, scientific observation is going to be the, uh, the first part. Requires researchers to record behavior systematically and objectively, right? I don't want to color with my own opinion or my own biases or things like that. I want to get the information as true as possible. Maybe conducted at, in a naturalistic setting or a laboratory. Either way. Okay. Essentially, I just sit and I observe and I, I write down what I saw. Okay. 35. Scientific method part two. Experiments establish ca uh, causal relationships among variables, right? If I'm doing like an experiment with caffeine, right? I want to see how much coffee it takes to get me jittery. <clears throat> so maybe I'm like, I don't know how much coffee is going to take, but I'm just going to keep sit down and start drinking coffee until eventually I know that I'm going to get jittery from too much caffeine. So I just sit and start drinking. And then I note down, I observe myself and I note down when I start to feel jittery. Okay. That's an experiment. Again, I could have 100 people, and maybe if you have 100 people with ADHD, and I want to see the effects of, of caffeine on them. So I give them 100 milligrams of caffeine, one half of them, and the other half I give them something that they think they're having caffeine, but they're not. And I observe the differences between the two. Okay, that's another experiment to see if there is, in fact, a difference. Um, variables are going to be independent variable. Um, basically, it's the variable that is introduced to see what effects it, it has on the dependent variable. Okay. So independent variable is going to be like the, the, the caffeine and all that kind of stuff. Dependent variable, <coughs> yeah, the, the dependent variable is going to be the, the variable that may change as a result of whatever new condition or situation the experimenter adds. Okay, independent variable, I add caffeine. Dependent variable, I'm going to see what the effects are upon somebody with ADHD or something like that. Okay. The reason I keep using ADHD and caffeine is because, in fact, that they have found that caffeine has a positive effect on most people who struggle with ADHD. Um, another another interesting thing, they actually found that nicotine, there's a, there's a very high tendency for people who have ADHD to get into smoking, okay, um, because they have found that nicotine helps a person with ADHD kind of focus. Now, that is not, like, if you have ADHD, don't necessarily start smoking, right? Like, negative side effects are cancer and death, but, uh, <clears throat> but... 
they have found that nicotine actually can help the brain uh, of somebody who struggles with ADHD focus. Okay, I have ADHD, and this is so this is something I found interesting personally. Uh, so groups, experimental group. It's going to be uh, the group that gets the particular treatment. This is the group that gets the the caffeine. Comparison group is going to be the group that thinks they got the caffeine, but they didn't, right? You got the guys that got the regular coffee, and you got the guys that got the decaf, basically. So experimental group is the ones that get the stuff. Comparison group is the group that don't. Okay. Um, another fun example of this one. They did a <laughs> research. They took three groups of people. They had one group of people basically just drink water. They had one group of people drink alcohol to the point of intoxication. And they had another group of people drink a substance that tasted like alcohol but in fact had no intoxicating effects. And then they observed them and they had them drink as much as they would normally drink to get drunk, okay. Um, what they found was that the people who thought they were getting drunk, but weren't, acted more drunk than those who were actually drinking the real alcohol. Which showed us, <clears throat> what we learned from this is that basically our, our expectations can have an effect upon how a given substance actually does affect us. So somebody who thinks that they're, who just thinks they're drinking water, but in fact they're getting intoxicated, they will in fact be having the physical effects of intoxication because it is slowing their system down. That's what alcohol does, it's a depressant. Um, but they're not going to, they, they won't show signs of being drunk. Like they're not gonna be like, woo, you know, like take your shirt off kind of thing. Okay, not gonna do any of that stuff. <laughs> not gonna be doing any of that kind of stuff typically. Um, because they're not having the expectations, the social expectations of being drunk. Okay. So the experimental group was the group that was beginning, uh, in this case, uh, they actually had two experimental groups. They had one that was actually getting the alcohol and the other group that was thinking that they were getting the alcohol. Okay. So away we go. 36. And before we get going with that, we're going to go ahead and do the last random fact. The human eye is sensitive enough to see a candle assuming that there's nothing like obscuring it. Like let's say like somehow I've got like a flat plane of you know, the world's not round or something like that, okay. Uh, but they can see a candle light in darkness from 30 miles away. That's how sensitive a human eye that's functioning properly um, is. Okay, so human eye can see a candle from 30 miles away. Back to our information. 36, how to conduct an experiment. So the experiment, you have many participants measured on many characteristics, including the, the depend, dependent variable, the behavior being studied, so ADHD or whatever, okay. Um, experimental group <coughs> versus the comparison group, break them up into your two groups. Um, some cases more groups, but again, we're just gonna see this. Um, special treatment, the independent variable gets that, right? They get the caffeine they, or alcohol or whatever. Um, other group doesn't get any special treatment or they might get a placebo, right? They might think they're getting a special treatment, but they're actually getting nothing. Um, and they're going to see if there's a significant change in the dependent variable, predicted outcome, and then see if the other group has no change, right, which is what we would expect. Okay. Uh, another study that they did, they, they were looking at depression, and they took one group of people, and they just were like, they struggled with depression, and they didn't do anything with them. They were just, you know, and they basically found that there was no change from, from the beginning of the experiment to the end of the experiment. They remained the same. They had another group of people take medication, they had another group of people exercise, and another group of people do meditation. They found that the people who did meditation had a significant drop in depression, not as significant as those that were taking medication, but the group who actually did the best were the people who got into exercising. They found that people who exercised regularly that were struggling with depression actually uh, decreased the negative effects of the depression significantly higher than any other group, meaning that the majority of people who struggle with depression, exercise is the best answer to deal with that. Okay. That's what we're that's what we're looking at. That's what that's how a decent experiment will be put forward. Okay. Um, keep on rolling. 37. Statistical measures often used in research analysis affect size, significance, cost benefit analysis. Like, right, if if, if you're like, oh, the benefit's minor, but it costs a million dollars to achieve it. Okay, we're not gonna do that. Um, odds ratio. Uh, Odds ratio is an interesting one, especially with like medications and things like that. They're gonna be like the odds of, of it helping you versus the odds of it hurting you. Um, and in some cases, it actually has extremely high odds of hurting you over helping you, but they still give it to you because it's it, it does in fact usually help a person in some way, shape or form. But the side effects can be devastating. Anyway, those are all things to be looking at. 
um, factor analysis, and meta-analysis. You can find all of these on page 29 of our book um, for more details on that. If you have questions about that, again, reach out to me. We're gonna keep on rolling. Just gotta wanna take an insane amount of time for you all. 38, <clears throat> scientific method part three, survey. Includes information collected from a large number of people through interview, questionnaire, or some other means. Um, some challenges with surveys. So surveys can be amazingly accurate, amazingly effective tools if you do them well. The problem is, is that it, it's very difficult to actually do them well. So one of the big challenges is acquiring valid survey data. Okay, you, sometimes it doesn't work um, because some people lie, right? If I'm asking you something, especially if it's something that's kind of touchy, right? Um, have you ever taken cocaine? You okay? You're like, no. Okay, you're like, even if you have, okay. Um, did you ever smoke a cigarette? Okay, whatever. That might not be as big a deal nowadays. Um, you look at pornography regularly. Okay, those, those are going to be things you might be like, no, I don't. Okay, uh, <clears throat> even if you do, or you know, whatever. It could be, it could be uncomfortable. Have you ever had sex? Okay, you ask, you ask a bunch of adolescents, have you ever had sex? Um, there's going to be a lot of times where people will say yes, even if they're actually virgins. Right. Those are going to be things that that can be. Uh, it can be tricky to get accurate information. Another thing that, that is an issue is that some people change their mind. They might have said yes, and they're like, no, oh, actually, now that I think about it, no. Okay, an hour down the road after I after you walked away from me. Um, so that can be that can be challenging. Survey answers are also influenced by the wording and the sequence of questions. A good surveyor can actually make you agree to about anything by wording questions a way that they want to and putting them in a certain order. They can lead you down a path that will lead you to the conclusion that they want you to get to. That's not an accurate survey if they do that. Another, so an example of this, um, even like the wording, just the specific wording of an individual question can make a big difference. For example, if I ask you, do you believe in aliens? When I do this in a live class, the majority of people don't raise their hand. I said, like, you can raise your hand if you believe in aliens. And I'll have, I had a class of about 60 students and like three or four of them are like, yeah, you know, like you have like one guy like, yeah, okay, I do, but I don't really want to be singled out. Okay. Um, so that's one question. Next question. Do you believe in, in life on other planets? Um, or at least there's a strong possibility of life on other planets. Okay. And then usually like half the class raises their hand. When I say life on other planets, also that opens the doors to like there could be some like micro, you know, several light years away on some other planet that's, you know, happens to be there. And there's life on another planet, right? Um, when I say aliens, it generally paints a picture of like little green men and flying saucers coming down and, and like abducting cows or something, right? Uh, that difference in wording changes people's uh, uh, answer. Same exact question. Life on other planets is in fact asking, do you believe in aliens? But if I ask you, like, do you believe in some kind of life somewhere else, anywhere else in the universe? It's a big, big universe, so there's a higher chance of it, right? It makes it a little bit more, feel a little bit more plausible than aliens, little green dudes walking around, right? Or big monsters trying to eat your face or something. Anyway, 39, studying development over the lifespan. Um, <clears throat> basic research designs, cross-sectional research. So groups of people of one age are compared with people of another age, right? I look at a bunch of 20 year olds and I compare them to a bunch of 40 year olds or something like that. Um, gives me a quick glance of how things may have changed. Longitudinal research, collecting data repeatedly on the same individuals as they age. A um, number of years ago, they did one of the, they actually took a group of college guys. Um, so they were all freshmen in college. They were first entering college. They started following them and they actually followed them until their natural deaths. It took, it took, uh, over 70 years to compile this research. It actually took the, the careers of multiple researchers to kind of keep following up with these groups. Um, but it taught us a lot, right? It, it gives us the, the the progression of these individuals and that we can see different factors in like what makes success and not and all these things, okay? Um, you know, likelihood of smoking versus drinking versus drug use versus, I mean, all these different factors were taken into place given their outcome. It's a relatively small group. They're all college-educated men, right? And, and so upper class, middle, you know, upper middle class generally for that time period. Um, but that is an example of a longitudinal research. Okay, shorter scale, you might do it like over the course of ten years. Maybe I maybe I look at like a three-year-old now, and I follow them for the next ten years until they're thirteen, and see how a certain thing affects them. Things like that. That's longitudinal research. Cross-sectional research. 
wait a second. That's the wrong word. Um, cross sequential. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm also mildly dyslexic. Cross uh, sequential research, studying several groups of people of different ages. So a cross sectional research approach, and following them over the years, a longitudinal approach. So not only like so now we're looking at say like ten year olds today, and then ten years from now we're still looking at those same ten year olds who are now twenty, but we're looking at a new group of ten year olds today, and then twenty years from now we got the people who are were ten now then twenty now thirty, people who were ten now twenty, and a new group of ten year olds today. And we're comparing to seeing kind of how the differences are over the course of time. Okay. Cross sequential. Okay. 40. Cautions and challenges from science. So correlations is going to be a big one. A correlation exists between two variables and if one variable is more or less likely to occur when the other does. Okay. So positive correlation. For example, correlation. Ice cream sales <coughs> and violent crime rise every year at exactly the same time and decrease at approximately the same time with each other. Why? Does ice cream eating cause violent crime? Do people who experience violent crime eat more ice cream? No, there's a correlation. The cause is actually the weather, right? The warm weather causes people to buy more ice cream, but warm weather also means that violent crime typically goes up. When the weather gets cold, more people aren't out and about, so violent crime drops. You also don't eat as much ice cream. Okay, there's a positive correlation between the two. They rise and fall together. Negative correlation would be like, let's say as ice cream sales rise, violent crime drops. That'd be a negative correlation, meaning that as one goes up, the other one goes down and then vice versa, okay? Um, zero correlation means that there's absolutely no way of connecting the two together whatsoever, right? Ice cream sales go up and violent crime just remains blah, and then they start to drop, and then for some reason violent crime goes up, and then it drops again, and then we don't know why. Okay, there's no there's no connection. So correlation is not causation. Ice cream sales do not cause people to do violent crime. They just happen to rise and fall. It's the it's the weather that's causing it. Okay. Qualitative research easily translated across cultures. Easier to summarize, chart, and replicate, and it's more vulnerable to bias. Harder to replicate. Um, so yeah, it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of a bigger, it's a way of basically of, of taking like surveys and the like and trying to make them universally applicable. It can be more challenging, um, even though it is in some way cases easier to work with. It's also vulnerable to, to issues. You're going to find that also in the book. Um, ethics. <clears throat> Each academic discipline and professional society involved in the study of human development has a code of ethics or IRB. Um, Ensure that participation is voluntary, confidential. This is going to be the basic rules today of what psychology follows. Not necessarily the rules that have always been followed. They've been put into place because basically we realize that we can hurt people with psychology um, if we don't do things well. And so with that, these rules have been put in place. And these are pretty universal worldwide. There's different groups like uh, APA, which you can be writing your paper in, right? The American Psychological Association is, is, is uh, one group that basically that sets rules into place. Um, there's going to be various university guidelines and rules that also kind of have above and beyond what the APA puts forward. Um, around the world, you're going to find different ones. Uh, you're going to find the the like British set of rules, like the American PA. You know, okay, whatever. So ensures that participation is voluntary, confidential, and harmless. That's a big one. You have to prove that what you're doing, for the most part, is not going to permanently damage a person in any way, shape, or form. Okay. You have to get permission from the person to do the experiments upon them, right? Which makes sense. And then that information, that, that the individual's uh, identity needs to remain confidential. Nobody knows who the individual was other than maybe the researchers themselves. Okay. So it ensures that participants understand the research procedures and any risks involved. If there is a chance of harm, you got to let them know what that chance of harm is. Okay. They can't be going into this blind. Um, promote research accuracy, honesty, and truthfulness, which is always, again, it doesn't do you much good to do research if you're not actually looking for truth. And then study and report data on many issues that are crucial for the optimal development of all people. What we're looking for is essentially information that is actually going to be applicable to actually helping mankind, either the individuals who are struggling with a certain specific area or as a whole. And that leads us to the end. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, informed consent is going to be a big part of that. Participants must understand the research procedures again of any risks. Okay, that's informed consent. You tell them, you know, there's a chance that you could get hurt in this, or there's a chance that you might get sick, or you know, the medicine might not do what we think it's going to do, or all these things. There's different factors here and possibilities of issues. And the person says, okay, I'm okay with that. We're go let's go ahead and do this. I, I can see that there's potential good coming out of it. Okay. You also, another interesting thing, or another side of this, if the research, if at some point you have to lie to the person. So let's say I, I bring somebody in, I'm like, we're doing research on what you think of cupcakes. What I'm actually studying is like, you know, your reaction to choice or something like that. Um, I tell you, you're, you're, I, what you're doing is just doing your taste of, of cupcakes. Um, once the re once the, the the experiment is done, I have to let you know that I actually lied to you, and that the research is really on how you deal with choice. Okay, so maybe I gave you like three cupcakes, and like you have to choose one. Um, you know, and then you taste it and tell me what you think about it, <clears throat> and then like while you're choosing, you know, tell me about what you're going through to while you're doing this process. Okay, at the end, I'm like, actually, I don't really give a rip about what you think about the cupcake. What I really want to know about is like why you what made you choose the cupcake that you chose. Okay, that's an example of that. And that is chapter one in a nutshell. So uh, if you have any questions, comments, things like that, make sure you reach out to me. You can message me in D2L. You can, you can make a comment in the, uh, in the discussion boards. There's one discussion area that's basically just for questions and comments. Um, so if you have anything like that, let throw it there. Message me directly in D2L if you want to get a quick answer. You can also email me through my work email. I'm not going to get back to you as quite as fast with that, more than likely, but it's still an option. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, make sure you do the quiz after you know that you've done this. You have those four random facts uh, to get the credit for, for accomplishing this, watching this video. And I'll see you in chapter two. Have a wonderful day, night, whatever it is that you happen to be at. Hope everything goes well, and I will talk to you later.